We are agile. OpenShift is agile. We are agile. Slides are agile. <laughs> That's how it works. So welcome. I have first, at the beginning, I will have several questions. Then we will start with the presentation. Uh, I would like you to raise your hands when you agree with, with it or if you are okay. So who is a developer? Raise your hand. Okay, solid. <laughs> who is operations? Okay, who is DevOps? Okay. And that's fine. Um, who, uh, who have already heard something about OpenShift? Wow. I like you guys. It's a good, good audience. So today, uh, my presentation will be about the internals of OpenShift. Uh, I have several slides that have the diagrams, how it works internally, how the requests go through, how the applications are deployed, and this kind of stuff. But this is something I expect from you. Usually, the presentations are the way that you expect something from me, but in my presentations, I expect something from my audience. So I, I do expect that you know something about cloud. I think that should be trivial. I do expect you are a developer of DevOps. We saw it's true. I do expect you have questions. I want you to have a questions. I want you to ask the questions. And if you have questions, I will try to answer. I will have questions and I will want you to answer. And if you do answer, I have this five of those which is four gig USB stick and also bottle opener. <laughs> I have five of those. So five questions from me and five people will get it. Of course, for the correct answers, not for the wrong ones. Uh, and I do prefer discussions. So I want you to be, or I want the presentation to be interactive. I want you to ask questions. I want me to ask questions. I want you to answer and me answer, right? Not me talking here and you sitting there and watching me. That's boring. For me. Maybe for you not, but it depends. So let's start with some basic understanding what is cloud computing. So what can cloud computing do for you? It can make the photos better. Sure, everybody believes in that. It can feed the hungry children in the Africa. Sure it can. Because cloud computing is the server bullet. It can also cure all the diseases. Right? I hope you agree, but it's a bit different, right? So, cloud computing is a way to deploy applications, systems, software, whatever. It is automation, or generally, how did cloud computing begin? What was the first step, how it started in, in, the, in the beginning? Okay, who conceived the, the first idea of, of cloud computing? Or like the, how it is presented that was the first step into cloud computing? Hmm? Virtualization allowed Amazon to do something that they called EC2 or as the cloud computing. And why they did it? Not really. They wanted money, exactly. And I don't know if I have some economics in here. But there is something in economy that is called economies of scale. And it means that the more you do something, the more you produce, the lower you can have your cost. And if you can provide computers or environments or virtualization for people, and the more people you can get in, the lower cost to run the infrastructure you can have. And this was the first idea when Amazon started with cloud computing. And they started to offering it publicly. Because they had some infrastructure, they had uh, the systems, they had everything, and they had cost to run it. And the, the utilization of the systems was not 100%, and it's not today also. But by providing these the infrastructure for people in case they didn't need it, they could lower the cost for them to run it. So that was the first idea. So that's called computing, sorry. That was, uh, did I get the correct answer? No, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we can uh, like separate cloud computing into three different uh, areas, private, public, and hybrid. So private is when you run it, 
uh, public is when somebody is running for you, hybrid is when it's combined. That should be all trivial. And we have three layers of, uh, in the cloud computing, just the basic ones, infrastructure, platform, and software as a service, which is depicted here. I like the picture because I think it makes it quite clear. And the two layers come in one group, and one is in a separate group. And this is a question for the, also, you can get the USB stick. Infrastructure is OpenStack. Infrastructure is OpenStack, that's software. That's not really machines. Mm, not really. You need tools for all in all of those areas. <laughs> You're making it too complicated. It's very simple. Could be. Okay, could be. Okay, you get a stick. It's not my an it's not the, the answer I wanted. I want you to I want a different answer. And I will like try to push you into the right way. Uh, who is the target audience? And platform? So both, like the, 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 this, the separate one is software as a service. Software as a service is targeting end users. You providing service to somebody. Google is providing email to my dad. Platform and infrastructure provides the services to the developers providing that service. So you get the systems to run the Gmail for my dad. So the, sep the, the, the special one is the top one. And uh, from my point of view, and that's what I wanted you to say. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Today we will be speaking about platform as a service, that's the middle one, uh, and we will specifically s like first need to say what it really does, and this, because you have already heard about OpenShift, this should be simple, right? Builds on infrastructure, that's all, that's trivial. Foundation for software as a service, it's in the middle, that's, uh, that's simple. It's, it's simple way to deploy applications. Have you ever used something like OpenShift, some platform as a service? Who has? EC2 is not platform as a service. <laughs> That's infrastructure. That's something different. Heroku, yes. Google App Engine, OpenShift. That's all platform as a service. So I want to deploy an application, and I want it to be simple. I'm a developer, and I want to deploy something, and I don't want to care about all the configurations or the services. I want something like this. I have a black box. I take my code. I push it there and I get a running application. That's the whole point. And this black box is the platform as a service. This black box is OpenShift. In case of OpenShift, it's not a black box. It's open source, it's Apache 2 license. But for the developer, he doesn't care what's there if he does not want to. He can, he doesn't have to. We will do a simple demo. You should, be, you should see the, the text on the, on the top, right? So let me uh, deploy a PHP application to the, to the OpenShift uh, online service. I will do RHC app create. I will give it some name. So it's, it's for example, PHP test. And I need to specify it's PHP 5.4 is already available. I believe so. Oh. Oh, network. Sure it is. And now I'm creating an application. So what's happening in the cloud? Somewhere is being some space created where my application will be running. It will configure the space to run PHP. So there will be Apache, there will be PHP 5.4, it will be configured. And I will get a Git repository where I can push my code and, I, and the code will be always deployed to that environment. So all of that is happening somewhere. And me as a developer, I don't have to care about it, how it works. I will get a Git repository, I will put my code in there, I will push the code, and the code will be deployed somewhere. It will be running somewhere. How they do it, I don't know, and I don't have to care. 
And that's the whole point of the uh, platform as a service. So I will let it go on the on the back end, sorry, background, and move in the presentation. So we have openshift.com, which is OpenShift run by Red Hat. And that's what I have been using in the in the in in the demo. And it's free as in a beer and free as in a freedom. Both. Because you can sign up for an account and you can get free applications. Each of the goals can use half gig of memory and one gig of space on the disk. This you get free and it's service provided by us. So this is free as in a beer, right? I always get it mismatched, which, which is weird. I think this is the free as in beer. And you also the platform that we run is open source, Apache 2 license, it's on GitHub. So you can actually go see the code, deploy it yourself. So it's also free as in a freedom because we do not lock you in. We show you what we do and we have, we have the full transparency in what, how it actually works. Okay, it was something for the beginning to warm you up a bit. And now I want to show you how it actually works internally. So some of the internals. Can you see it? It works, finally. In, in the morning I had a presentation and I showed, I showed a picture and it was just white. <laughs> so I was afraid it may not work today. So, but it works. And this is some diagram that shows how OpenShift works. I think the presentations will be available. Will be the, so we, yeah, so you can just download it there, you don't have to photo. And you see there are two different actors outside of the platform. You can see them on the, on the, on the right. <laughs> Actually, they can be the same, but it's two different ways how to operate OpenShift. You can either use command line tool or you can use a web browser. You can, you can control the platform from web or from command line, depends on your skill set or what you really want to do at the time. Something goes in and there is a request. So you request to create a new application or whatever and this goes somewhere, it's on the top. It goes to the broker. Broker is the central piece of OpenShift. It's the most important one and I'm not sure if we have some presentation about broker really this year. Marek, you have no idea, right? No. So broker is the central part. It decides how it will handle the request. So it asks it, can I get new application? It will check some data storage on the, on the left side and it will answer yes, it's possible. So if it's okay, then it sends some uh, request to the node where we deploy the application. So we have two different kinds of systems or operating systems. One is node and one is a broker. These are different. On nodes, we do deploy the applications. On the broker, that's just the management. Just thinking if you do understand what I'm talking about. Who understands? Who is lost? Come on. <laughs> so can you ask the question? Anonymous question. Uh, that's that's difficult to do in here. You can send me an SMS if you don't understand, and I will not say who, what, who it was. Uh, not really. So, do you have something that, you, if you want, if you don't want, you don't have to. Okay. Okay. Just fine. So, on the node, there is a node system that that handles all the deployments on the node. So it creates the Git repository, it creates uh, the environment, and it creates the, the the gear. That's the on the left bottom, the the, the, the light gray uh, rectangle is the is the correct pronunciation. Rectangle with rounded corners, to be precise. And in these gears, we have cartridges. Cartridge is something, uh, it's a software you want to run in the rectangle. No, <laughs> gears, not rectangle. <laughs> Just the visualization. Uh, so, yeah, so you have cartridges and you run them in the gears. The gear is the environment, the cartridge is the software. So we have a cartridge for PHP, that's something I used in the, in the demo. We have cartridge for Java, we have cartridge for Jenkins, we have cartridge for Perl, Python, Ruby, Node.js, 
MySQL, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, it's too much of them I don't remember already. Uh, and everybody is encouraged to create their own cartridges. So cartridges are free open specification of some shell scripts, of some code that everyone can create. So two weeks ago, I got interested in the closure. Who knows closure? Like a language. It's a lips, Lisp dialect on uh, JVM. And I thought, this is interesting. I want to run it on OpenShift. So what I did was, okay, I will create a cartridge for closure. And I created the cartridge, and now everybody who wants to try closure can take the cartridge, deploy it on OpenShift, and try the language in the cloud. So you don't have to install it yourself on your machine. You can actually just take it, sign up for OpenShift, get a free account, create the application, you will get closure, uh, closure deployed, you will take the Git repository, you will put the code there, you will push, and it will deploy it for you. And this was simple, it was like two, three, maybe four hours of work, and now everybody can use it, so it's very simple. So the specification is very nice, it's not complicated, it just, how, it just tell us, tells us how to control the software you want to deploy, nothing else. Oh, going to the right. So this is the general idea how it works. I think this is too complicated and my time is running. And we see that the demo finished. So I can actually go to my browser and try to go to php test anyone.rhcloud.com. And the application is running. So it's, it deployed the application and I did one command on the command, li on the command line. And I didn't have to configure anything. Now I can take my code, I can put it in the Git, push it, and it will run just the same. No Apaches, no PHPs, no configuration files. We are freed from that. Ah. Let's move. So actually, this is how the communication internally works. Uh, so you have a broker that's on the, on the top. It has some kind of REST API, so anyone can create its own client. I have used the, our client tools, which is called RHC in the demo. You can you create your own. We have a binding for Java, so anyone who is developing in Java can talk by using the library to the, to the REST API. And you can create your own. And the broker exposes this API. And you can issue the call and have something broker to, to, be, to do for you. The broker is a Rails application. So if you want to provide new features, you can just clone the repository on GitHub, and you can, who knows Ruby? Who knows Rails? So that's like 20 people. I am expecting 20 pull requests till yet tomorrow evening. I think we actually do have uh, some open positions here in Brno. Michal? For, <laughs> for cartridge development, right? Yes. So if somebody would be interested in developing cartridges and helping with OpenShift, we are hiring here in Brno. So you can just get, yes? So I am expecting new colleagues by Monday. <laughs> and so, so, and the broker communicates with MongoDB. MongoDB is used to store the, in the runtime information. So running applications, user accounts, and this kind of stuff is stored in MongoDB, but can be replaced. There is a thin layer for storing the data, so you can use LDAP or other stuff. We do use MongoDB. We use bind for DNS. Uh, so OpenShift will configure bind to provide the DNS for the application. You have seen that I got a publicly available DNS for the application. It was a php test-mln.rhcloud.com. Uh, so the DNS server had to be configured to point to some IP address in the platform, right? So this is also done by, by the broker. We have implementation for bind, but can be replaced by something else. And LD, LDAP or KDC, KDC is uh, Kerberos, I believe. 
so this can be uh, used also for storing the accounts and so, so the, this stuff. And as I said before, the other nodes, we have the nodes for broker and the nodes for running the applications. And the nodes are separated into gears and the gears are running the cartridges. This should be simple. This is how the, the request comes through the platform. So you do a request, it goes to the REST API, brokers consumes it, it pushes the information on the ActiveMQ, use ActiveMQ for message passing in the platform, but can be replaced again. And once again, it sends the information using mCollective. Who knows mCollective? So who explains what, two sentences to explain mCollective and get a stick? No? Nobody is brave enough. mCollective is part of the Puppet project, that's the first sentence, and mCollective uh, provides a standard for communicating for many nodes, so it provides a distributed uh, quorum or, and this kind of stuff. And it helps us to, to re not reinvent the wheel because we would be reinventing something Puppet guys already did, so we just reuse the, the project. And this then issues some kind of API, uh, no, system calls on the, on, the, on the node to start the systems, so system services, create uh, SE Linux uh, contexts and this kind of stuff. This is how it works when you issue a request to the application. So I already have the application running and I will open the URL in the browser. What happens is the request comes to the port 80. What other port it will come to? 80 or? Okay, too many of you, I don't have so many sticks. <laughs> uh, for, for free, exactly. Uh, and from there it goes to some translation layer. We have a routing layer that translates the, the, the domain name that is provided using the host header in the HTTP protocol, and we translate it into the IP address that is internal in the platform. So the IP address of the application is not publicly available. We have a layer that shields the applications running inside the platform from the outside world. And there is a layer that translates the requests, the domain names to the, to the actual IP addresses, and then we route the, the rest of the request to the application itself. So, I said that we use HTTP headers for routing. What kind of ser what can you expose as a public service from OpenShift? Web Only web service, exactly. I mean, you could. Well, the, the problem is with HTTP protocol, we know in the protocol where the request is going, right? Uh, not, yeah, but it's in the protocol. The protocol has the information of the target. But in MySQL, you don't have the information. So something comes and you have to decide what kind of, inf where to route, what kind of uh, node has to receive this uh, MySQL connection. How would you decide? It's not in the protocol. It's not in the MySQL protocol. So this is difficult. What you can do is artificially generate random ports on the outside, assign them to some internal port, and use IT IP tables to route the requests, the connections from the outside port to the, to the internal one. But that's a bit hacky and doesn't work yet uh, out of the box. Right, cool. Mm -hmm. Like inside the platform. They are also shielded because we use the S Linux to isolate the applications from each other. And also the communication is secured, but I am not a networking expert. I would encourage you to come uh, to a workshop that's at 2 p.m., right? And that will be run by Marek. And Marek is like me, Marek. Uh, is either Marek? Uh, is a uh, DevOps or operations of OpenShift Online. So he has experience how, how, it, how it actually works. So he probably he will be able to answer the question much more deeply. Yeah. So a node is a, can be physical machine 
it can be a virtual machine. So we actually, I believe I have the diagram on the next slide. No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> so there is the second, second diagram I didn't put in the presentation. Uh, we have also scalable applications. So you have scalable and non-scalable ones. In the non-scalable, non it's just one gear running somewhere on one node and the requests are coming straight to the application. Uh, if you have a scalable one, then we put HA proxy in front of the application and we load balance the requests uh, to the gears that provide this application. So we do the load balancing. We also can monitor and we monitor the requests. We monitor the response times and we scale up and scale down the application, the nodes, the numbers of, of the workers for application based on the load of your application. So it auto scales up and down, that's possible. And we found, Grant, is it public or not? <laughs> the, the scaling. The cust it's, it's public. <laughs> it's public now. Uh, no, the, the custom logic for scaling. Oh, no, it's not public. Okay. You don't. Yeah. You are not allowed to present this pre this this video before we do it. <laughs> yeah, now it's written already. <laughs> okay, so it's possible. <laughs> It's awesome answer. And also makes you know something that you should know, not know. Uh, okay, so what's the time? 10 minutes left. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, some other questions? Yeah. They do have their own loopback interface internally, I believe. But they, are from outside world, they look like application running on the on the on the node. So they actually do have their own virtual interface inside. So they do have their own um, their own IP address. It just looks the same for each of these applications internally because for all of them it's one two seven zero zero one. Oh, like if you deploy your own open chip and you want to you you want a special IP address for every application. I think that should be possible. I mean there's no limitation for that. We pr I believe we just don't use it. Uh, but also I would encourage you to come for the workshop and we can uh, try to think about about it more deeply. I like the I like the question. I will give you one stick. Just then you can come for it. Was a challenging one. Oh, it encourages people to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
So at this time, we do we are limited to HTTP because we need some way to translate the, the connection to the target. So, so there would be it would be possible. That it, I think it would not be that that difficult to generate some kind of port that would be publicly available and set, uh, set up IP tables to route the, the connections from there to the internal one. But this generally is the same limitation we have for SSL and other technologies. We don't, we, in the online version, we cannot provide so many IP addresses so we can like satisfy everyone. Good answer? It could be exploited to malicious purposes. Uh, in the legal terms, it said that you should not do it. Uh, we do block some of the of the target ports. We do. I think it, there is some kind of monitor monitor that tries to decide if it's malicious or not. But mostly, you can use it for many things. Uh, there is a blog post how to run a Minecraft server on OpenShift, so it's possible. Uh, I have been running. Uh, IRC bots inside OpenShift, so that works just fine too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you had the yeah. That's that's true. Uh, I think we do use the we use SE Linux to isolate the applications in their environments, and we do use then SE Linux logs to check what the applications were doing. We don't really see how they work; we just see what they did from outside, and based on that we try to decide. We as OpenShift or like a service provider, we don't access your data inside. This is yours. Nobody, even the develop the operations, are not allowed to go inside. They cannot see the code you are running. We just see what you are doing from outside. Yeah. You want to answer? So, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, OpenShift runs on OpenStack very nicely. If you go to um, OpenStack into the heap templates in their repo, there are sets of OpenShift um, origin, um, CentOS, and Fedora 19 templates, and as well as an enterprise template for deploying. And it's very, very simple to run and deploy um, and scale on OpenStack. So talk to me at the booth later. OK, so that was the answer, probably. Yeah, at this, at this time, if you have two separate applications, you cannot communicate with each other. You can create a scalable application, and in the scalable one, we provide the communication inside that application. So the, up, the scalable application consumes many gears, so it can run on many nodes, and you can communicate from one service to the other inside. But you cannot communicate outside of that context. They think they can talk about uh, through TCP, whatever. That inside the context, it's uh, up to you. Mm. Well, you can you can com you can connect out using TCP. That's fine. You cannot connect in using TCP. So what we what what the the, uh, the question was is. For example, you want to run uh, Redis cluster inside. So Redis is using their own protocol. It's not. Uh, it's TCP and text pro text, ba text line or line based protocol uh, over TCP. So this is possible inside that context of the scalable application. You cannot do something like this from one application to other application. But if you want to run Nag Nagios inside OpenShift, it connects out using TCP. That should work. No problem. Uh, 
uh, we do support the JBoss application server, so that's, that comes out of the box. Uh, WebSphere and Oracle, as far as I know, do are not so much friendly with our isolation. So they really expect you to get a root, uh, root uh, directory, root directory, and they expect to have files in some hard-coded path. And that's, as far as I know, the problem. One of the one of the problems to actually deploy Oracle or WebSphere on, uh, on inside the gear. But we will be coming with uh, Docker integration. Docker creates virtual uh, image, and inside that image, it would be possible to deploy WebSphere or Oracle. So this is something that will come, I don't know when, sometime, yeah. So we have like three more minutes, two more minutes. So one more question. Yes? Exactly, you, you just answered your question. We don't see what's going inside the gear. So what we see from outside is there are connections coming or not coming to the gear. If they're not coming, it's idle. It doesn't work. It's not, not needed to be running, actually. So we make it idle. And once the connection will come, we will spin the application again, and it will answer the request. So that's how it works. So as I said before, OpenShift is open source, so you can actually download it and run it yourself. So uh, this is where we have the, the project page at this time. So you can go openshift.github.io, you can download the image there and deploy it. We will have a workshop at 2 a.m., uh, 2 p.m., no, sorry, not 2 a.m., <laughs> I'm not doing that. Uh, 2 p.m. Uh, in the lab one with Marek, and we will be deploying OpenShift. 